I have a question for you this morning. Uh, has anybody ever gotten sick before? You guys gotten sick? Yeah? Just a few of you, I see. Yep. Just a few of you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, we all get sick once in a while in our lives. Uh, one of the worst times that one of my family members, Addie, uh, got sick was on vacation. And getting sick on vacation is the worst. Anybody ever been really sick on a vacation before? Yeah, a few people. I mean, it is the worst because you know as a parent that you have spent money booking things and wanting to go places, and yet your kid is sick. And it's like you either say, all right, kid, suck it up. You're going to go. We spent a lot of money on this. Or you're going to say, no. Uh, you know, my wife said, no, she's going to get better in bed. And I'm like, get up. You're going to go. No, I didn't do that. I'm not that mean. OK, I see some of your faces. I'm not that mean. But my little girl got definitely sick on this vacation that we were at. And it was a type of vacation where, where you don't have to rent a car. They take you to the hotel room, and, and you're supposed to be there, and all the transportation is provided. And it was so exciting. Uh, and then you know, about four days within the vacation, she comes down with a fever. And it's like, what is happening? Well, maybe it's just the traveling part. Maybe it's just, you know. She hasn't got enough to eat or, or something like that. And the fever got worse and worse. Um, and finally, it's like, we have to take her in somewhere. So we found this clinic that was open. It was about 40 minutes away from our hotel. So I had to call it for an Uber. An Uber came and picked us up. We traveled 40 minutes to the clinic. We were there for a few hours to find out that she had influenza A and that she was running a high fever. They had to pack her with ice all around her because her fever was so high. And her fever got so high that they said, we might have to take her to the hospital. And we're like, please, Lord, no, not on vacation. Lord, please, let this, let this our little girl uh, fever come down. And luckily, it came down enough that where they let us go. But we had to go and get prescri uh, prescription of, of whatever the medicine is for influenza. And we all had to take it because we were all in a hotel room, and it was gross. It was a gross thing to take, but especially for kids. Does anybody's kids take medicine well? Oh, no. I see some of you are like, no, uh-uh. No, they don't. And uh, same thing with Addie. Her, she did not take medicine well. And it's like, please, Addie, whatever, whatever, please take this medicine, and we'll get you better. No, because it tasted nasty. It's like, why can't they make children's medicine taste good? It just tasted nasty. It's like, come on, you can take it. You have to take it to get better. And finally, you know, we're, you know, she's, she's out for the count for like six days. And finally, after a day or so, it's like, okay, you have to take your medicine. And Don and Brianna are off doing some vacation stuff. I'm in the hotel room uh, with my daughter. And I'm like, you got, please just, I'm crying because I'm like, please just take your medicine. She's like, Dad, get out of the way. You're, I'm missing Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Like, get out of the way. His TV goes on. Like, no, please. And then Dawn calls and she's, has she taken her medicine? I'm like, no, she's not taking her medicine yet. And she goes, well, tell her that mom will get her, mom and dad will get her whatever she wants, you know, if she takes her medicine. And I'm like, okay. Yo, Addie, whatever you want. And we're thinking from the place that we're at, like a toy or, or something else that's it's a little bit more expensive. And, and, uh, and I'm like, Addie, whatever you want, whatever you want, just to take your medicine. You have to take your medicine for the rest of the vacation, and you can get whatever you want. And she goes, really? I can get whatever? Yeah, whatever you want. OK, I want a puppy. <laughs> like, what? Now, that's, that's not the deal. She's like, you said whatever, you're, whatever you want. You're not a liar, Dad, are you? <laughs> like, no, stop it, little girl. You know, no. And so now we have a puppy. <laughs> and so we have, and this was about five years old, so now we have a five year old puppy. And it's not, it's not just any old puppy. You know, I grew up on a farm, dogs are supposed to be big. And dogs are ones that just show up. <laughs> they just show up because somebody dropped them off in the country. And so big dogs, that's what I grew up with. But no, this dog I paid for. Can you believe that? You pay for a dog. And not that, it's a sheepoo. 
So it's a little dinky dog, but I made sure that we got a, a male, a, a guy dog. It's going to be tough. It got chased by a rabbit once. It was terrible. <laughs> I was so embarrassed of this dog. But my kids are like, yeah, this dog, we're going to name it like Peanut or some kind of fluffy name. I'm like, no, I'm putting my fist down on this. This boy dog, this killer that we bought is going to be named Remington because of the firearms and the, you know, the ammunition, Remington. It's a tough name. Okay, we'll call him Remy. I'm like, no. And now this dog sleeps in my bed. It's just like, come on. But you'll do anything when your child is sick, right? Sickness is never a good thing. But we have to take what we have and, and make the best of it sometimes. And this is what we're going to see in Acts chapter 13, the rest of Acts chapter 13 here, starting with verse 13. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 13 with me or get your electronic device on. It's also going to be on the screen. But we're going to see Paul here. We're going to see Paul and, and we're going to see his bravery in some way here. So Acts chapter 13, verse 13, this is what it says. Now Paul and his companions, and his companions were Barnabas and Mark, right, set sail from Papos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John, that's John Mark, well, the gospel who wrote the gospel of Mark, left them and returned to Jerusalem. And the reason he left Paul is because uh, theologians say, scholars say that Paul and, and Mark, they butted heads. They didn't really click. And so Mark went home to be with his mom because at his mom's house is where the disciples in Jerusalem would gather and where the counseling would happen uh, in Jerusalem. Verse 14, but they went on to Perga and came to Antioch and Pasida. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. You know, one of the amazing things about these two verses here that, that I would like to point out is the bravery that we usually just pass by when we read this. And you're like, what kind of bravery? We always see is a guy went home, and they went to a different town, and they went to another synagogue. What's the bravery about that? Well, here's the thing. Pasita of Antioch, it stood on a plateau, this, this city, did, or this town did, on a plateau which was about 3,600 feet above sea level. Where they were before was a swampy land area, very humid down there. So they traveled up to Pasita, 3,600 feet above sea level. And to get to it, they had to travel over a mountain range, Tarsus, or Toars, to something like that, <laughs> mountain range, by one of the hardest roads that were ever there in Asia Minor. I mean, this road was difficult because there were so many robbers and murderers on this road. In fact, some historians uh, of first century world said that this, this road was the most notorious road in that area because the Romans there, when their jail cells would get full of criminals, they would go and they would place them on this road because it was a difficult place. And that's where criminals went and robbers went and thieves went. So why would I call Paul brave for going over these mountains? Well, one, he has to deal with robbers and thieves. And, but another reason is that Paul went to Antioch and Pasita to, to preach the gospel. But this area, this region, is also known as Galatia. And during this time, Paul writes a letter to the Galatian people in the New Testament, this book Galatians, in the Bible. He writes this letter to these people. The region was a Roman province. This region, Galatia, was high in the mountains. And this is what Paul says in his letter to these people. In Galatians 4, 13 through 14, 
He says, as you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. So when Paul came to Galatia, that this region that we're seeing in Acts 13, verses 13 and 14, Paul was a very sick man. Very sick man. And some of the earliest traditions and theologians believe that this sickness was a debilitating uh, fevers and headaches. And some say that this is the, the thorn that was in the side that Paul talked about in 2 Corinthians 12. And like I said, some of the oldest traditions think that Paul suffered from, from these terrible headaches, these terrible fevers that would come on. Most likely, the explanation of this was he was a victim, victim of a reoccurring malaria disease, which makes sense because in low-lying where they were in that swampy area, that would cause malaria to start up again. And so he had to get somewhere higher, a higher elevation uh, to, to shake it off to this plateau country because the low-lying town of Pamphylia was just not working out. So when you're sick, do you feel like traveling? I know I don't. Like when I get sick, man, I am, well, I'm the best patient ever. <laughs> You guys believe that right now? I could say whatever I want. You don't know me. No, just kidding. Let me tell you this. Let me, let me say and confess that I am the worst patient ever. Oh, good. My wife didn't say amen. Thank you for that. But I am the worst patient ever. I, I, it's a head cold, and I'm out for the count. Like, I'm gone for two weeks. I'm, I'm, I'm in my basement. The, the shades are, uh, it's all dark in the basement. I feel like I'm dying, head cold. Honey, please, can I, have a, can I have a glass of water? Honey, please, please, can you bring me a cold rag? I'm so hot, I'm so cold. And she's like, please, man up, will ya? Wives, are you there? You, you know what I'm talking about, right? I see, you're, you're nudging your husband or the, next, the person next to you. You're like, yeah, that is you to account. Like, I couldn't do what Paul did. Paul is sick here, and he's traveling. And I'm like, I'm sick. I'm staying home. I'm done. I can't do anything. The great thing about Paul is that he never, or it never struck him uh, to turn back. It never, it, it never came into his mind to say, you know what, I got to stay here. It never did that. Even when his body was aching, Paul never stopped driving forward with his purpose. His purpose, which was to tell people about Jesus Christ. And this is where we find ourselves. Paul, Paul has went into the synagogue. The first thing he does is he goes into the synagogue. It's a Sabbath day. So he goes to learn and to hear the writings, the teachings of the law of Moses, the religious leaders, what they have to say. And he gets asked to give an encouraging word. This is what it says in Acts 13, verse 15. After the reading from the law of the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, meaning Paul and Barnabas, saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up. I love Paul. Even though he's sick at this time, even though he, he doesn't feel well, he still stood up and, he motion, and motioning with his hand said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. Now, that is saying those that are Hebrews and you believe in, in God Almighty, the one and true God, and those that are Gentiles here that have converted to Judaism, listen up. And for the next eight or so verses, Paul gives a history lesson of the Hebrew people. And when they come to verse 26, and when we come to verse 26, and we see Paul say this, 
He says, brothers and sons of the family of Abraham, And those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterance of the prophets, which you read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found him no guilt worthy of death, They asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. Now I can just imagine the religious leaders hearing this going, what we have heard about what they did in Jerusalem. And we believe that they were right because it was the high priest that that had had Jesus, this man Jesus, Killed, And so what you're saying is not good. And they're kind of getting irritated a little bit. They're kind of getting uh, on their edge of their seats, a little, a little nervous on their seats. And here's Paul. He's laying it down. He's like something that you read every single week and something that you talk about every single time you're gathering together, something you read in the law of Moses and in the prophets has been fulfilled. And yet, yet there's still, still murmurs of, of this not being true. See, through Paul's message right here, And through him presenting the gospel, we see three main elements of this gospel of Jesus that that remain the same yesterday as it is today. These three elements are the same as when Paul was speaking the gospel as it is today when you tell people about Jesus. And these three elements are this, the first element that we need to know. And if you're a note taker, a great time to jot this down. The first element that we need to know is that through the gospel, we find that the birth, the death, and the resurrection is the fulfillment of prophecy. It's a fulfillment. And we need to know that. Just like those synagogue rulers needed to know that every time they read the Lamos, every time they read the prophets, like Isaiah, What was talked about, the Messiah, has been fulfilled. As we read this part of Acts 13, we need to remember Paul is very sick at this time. He has an illness at this time. And it's a Sabbath day. He's in the synagogue, right? He's probably there just to kind of get fed himself, to listen to the law of Moses, listen to the prophets, because it's still very important. And these religious leaders that are saying, man, come and speak to us. So Paul's like, all right, no matter what, I'm sick, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the word of God. Again, Acts 13, 27 For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterance of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate. And these synagogue rulers would have known exactly who he's talking about, that that Caiaphas, the high priest, asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the tomb. And then Paul went on in verse 30. Paul went on saying this, but God raised him from the dead. And now these synagogue rulers would really be on edge, kind of antsy a little bit. Because they're like, what is he saying? But God raised him from the dead. And for many days, he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers that I just talked about, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. 
And at this time, the synagogue leaders would have been like, what is he saying? You cannot be saying this. There's probably a little commenting back to him, like, be quiet. What are you saying? And then we jump to verse 38. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers. This is Paul speaking here. That through this man, through this man that I've been talking about, through Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. At this time, the synagogue leaders would have been like, wait a minute, stop what you're saying. But then there's other people in the crowd. There's, there's Gentiles that have, have converted to Judaism in the crowd saying, man, I do feel stuck. Or, or maybe they're, they're a slave to a Roman and they, they feel like freedom. I can have freedom. I, I can be freed and it's not by the law of Moses. And then we get to the second element of the gospel. And that is through the gospel, we find, we find forgiveness. Isn't that great? Isn't that beautiful? That through this good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing that he came for us, he died for us, he rose again for us, and he's coming again for us, through this good news, we can have forgiveness of the deepest, darkest sins in our lives. We can have forgiveness of addictions that we have. We can be set free from the pain that we feel inside, the anger that some of us deal with, the depression that some of us deal with, the loneliness, the hopelessness. We can have freedom because we find forgiveness in the one true Messiah, Jesus Christ. No matter what you have done, who you are, what you look like, there is forgiveness for you through the one and only Jesus. And if you are feeling trapped by the sins that you have or chained down by your addictions, you can be set free. And it's only by the blood of Jesus that we can be set free and forgiven. And that's good news. That's good news. I know for me it's good news because I'm the worst of the worst when it comes to sinning. I'm a sinner. I might be up here preaching the gospel. Guess what? I am a sinner, and I need Jesus just like you need Jesus. I need Jesus even more. And I need his blood to cover me. And I need his forgiveness. Because I was bought with a price. Just like every one of you were bought with a price. And that price is Jesus' blood. And through Jesus, we find forgiveness. Through Jesus, we find freedom. And that, folks, is good news. Amen? That is good news. But then there's the third element of the gospel. Remember, the first element is that the birth, the death, and the resurrection is the fulfillment of prophecy. And then we get to that second element, what we just talked about, that, that we find forgiveness in the Gospels. And then we see the third element here. The third element of this Gospel, when Paul says this in verse 40 of chapter 13, he says, be aware. Be aware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them the next Sabbath. Be aware. Be aware. 
You that are saying that this is not true, or you that are saying, I don't need this, or you that are saying, ah, oh, Christianity is just a crutch, it's just something to lean on that you don't really need. You that are looking, your scoffers, you're outstanding, you will perish if you don't believe in this. If you don't believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, he is the only way for eternal life. That's good news. And I love the part, as they went out, these people begged. Because when people hear the good news and they, they start to, to understand it, they want more of it. Man, to have the good news as the, the addiction of our life, wouldn't that be great? To have the good news as an infectious thing that goes out from us. That's good right there. The people were begging to hear it. Please come back next Sabbath so we can hear truth, so we can hear grace, so we can hear love. See, something happens when you start speaking truth, though, because not everybody loved it. Something happens when you start speaking the gospel message, when you start proclaiming Jesus as Savior, when you're, when you're doing that. See, this third element of the gospel happens. See, that through the gospel, we find that for some people, it's good news. And for others, it's offensive news. Sometimes it offends people. Why? Because people are so selfish and self-centered. I want to have it my way because the gospel message says that we have to give up our old self because we are made new in him. But it offends people because it's like, man, I want it my way. I want it the way I like it. This is the way I need it to happen. I am in charge. Nobody will tell me what to do or not, or not do. It becomes offensive. And sometimes Christians get it wrong because Christians become offensive when they don't use the gospel. And they start saying other things like, oh, you can't come to our church. You don't look right. Oh, our church isn't for that. Our church is just to build the believers up. We don't really need new people in here to tell them about the gospel. We just need to build the saints. That's offensive. What a better way to tell people about Jesus than inviting them <laughs> to hear about Jesus, to sing about Jesus. Sometimes Christians can be the most offensive people. Why? Because they're so judgmental. The Bible talks about Christians, in a way, are Christ followers, that we should keep each other accountable. Don't judge those that don't believe in Jesus, because they don't know yet. But when we start judging those outside the doors, those that don't know Jesus, and saying, why can't you do this better? You should be living your life better. That becomes offensive, and it turns people off of the gospel. Why don't we just love people like God loved them and say, hey, we have something for you. We have an affection for you that's going to be spread. And that's the good news. It's Jesus Christ. And he loves you so much. And I love you. And here's the thing. Christ followers, sometimes we get it wrong because we think it's all about us. Well, our preferences, our likes, it's not. It's all about him. And we need to do whatever it takes to get people in front of the gospel message. See, the gospel of Jesus Christ is life-giving, and it's life-condemning. This gospel can free you or it can offend you. And we see this happening in Acts 13, verse 44, when it says this, the next Sabbath, 
comes. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with jealousy. Isn't that funny? It's like, wait a minute. Where were all these people when, when I was teaching the prophets or when I was talking about the law of Moses? Because that's a true thing to talk about. Now, when, when they saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what Paul was saying, what was spoken by Paul, revealing him. They were saying, no, what he's saying is not right. That's not true. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. No, no, you can't listen to that. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly. And I can just see them saying it louder, saying, hey, it is necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, you religious leaders. It's necessary that I, that I say this to you. The word of God to be spoken first to you since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life because the gospel message is an eternal message. It shows you, it points to eternal life. It's the compass to eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles now because you religious leaders, you're not understanding this. We're going to go to the Gentiles the ones that are farthest away. Because remember, they're in a Roman providence right now where mostly Gentiles are worshiping other gods. Not only that, they're sacrificing things to these other gods. They're, they have perverse ceremonies to these other gods. They, they only know a life where it's multiple gods and they have to do multiple things to to be living in that area, to get rain, they have to do certain, certain things. To, to have children that are healthy, they have to do certain things for these gods. <laughs> and Paul's like, no, no, we are turning to you, Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And just like he instructed Paul and Barnabas, guess what? He is instructing us today. Those that believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, he's instructing you today, just like he did with Paul and Barnabas. He's saying, I have made you a light for the Quad Cities. I have made you a light for your neighbor. I have made you a light for your coworker. I have made you a light for your children. I have made you a light for your parents. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation that you may bring this message of rescue, this message of hope, this good news to the ends of the earth. It means to your neighbors, to your workplace, to the grocery store. This gospel is life-giving. It changes life. Paul believed it so much that even though he was sick, very sick, he had to go and tell people about it. Paul risked his own life many times, and we'll see it more, to make sure people heard about this gospel message about Jesus Christ because he believed it so much. So I want you to wrestle with that question. This, do you believe it that much? That you would do anything to make sure people heard about it? For you that know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, do you believe it to your core so much 
that you would do whatever it takes for people in your sphere to know the life-changing message of Jesus. Do you believe it so much that you are willing to go to your neighbors? When Paul and Barnabas took such a bold step and spoke out and spoke about Jesus and spoke about the saving grace, they spoke truth also. It says this in Acts 13, verse 48. It says, and when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed, I mean, as many as people that, that accepted this gospel message, accepted that Jesus Christ did die for them, that Jesus Christ rose again for them, they confessed it with their mouth. They believed in the heart. <laughs> they believed this life that only Jesus gives. They were, became so joyful, and they rejoiced, and they glorified because they knew that they were free. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. After people started to come to Jesus, Paul and Barnabas faced some opposition, though. It's like if you were here last week, I, I said, it, and when you preach the gospel or when you tell people about this life-changing message, when you love God and love others so much that you live it and you speak it, there will be opposition that happens. And it's the same thing with Paul and Barnabas. See, some people with some power and some standing within that city, both Jews and Gentiles, they came together and they drove Paul and Barnabas out of the city. It's like, get out of here. You, you've stirred up the trouble enough. There's enough people in the city rejoicing and glorifying this Jesus guy. You got to get out of here. And they were threatening Paul and Barnabas to death. But this is what happens in Acts 13, verse 51. But they, Paul and Barnabas, but they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but when I get rejected, I don't feel joyful sometimes. I don't feel like, woohoo, yay, Holy Spirit. It's just amazing what Paul and Barnabas did. And if they can do it, I can do it, right? And if I can do it, you can do it. That when we get rejected, because there'll be times that you'll get rejected because of this gospel message, opposition will come, we dust the shoes off and say, okay, let's go again. Because nothing will hold back this gospel message because it is an unstoppable force. Because Jesus, his love and his grace is unstoppable. I hope that that day that I get rejected or opposition come, I can rejoice all the more. Be filled with the Holy Spirit to go and do more. How could Paul and Barnabas shake off this rejection? Because they believed it was because they knew it. They believed it and they knew that what their job was. And their job wasn't about them. It wasn't to get everybody to like them. It wasn't to get their own way. It wasn't to gain power or prestige. It wasn't to try to fit in. It was to proclaim the good news. And them knowing that, that if they pro proclaim it, if they speak it, if they live it, he will grow it. That God would grow it. 
And that's what our big idea is this week. BCC's big idea. The thing I really want you to take away is an unstoppable church knows that their job is to live it and speak it. And his job, God's job, is to grow it. It's not about us. It's all about Jesus. And do you live a life that lives that out? Do you live a life that proclaims that? Do you live a life that speaks volumes? The love, the grace, and the truth of Jesus, the Savior.